Welcome to Stroke Buddies uh, Stroke Survivors Support Group meeting. I'm Ralph Preston. Stroke Buddies is my group. We hold these every Tuesday at 11 o'clock Eastern time if you'd like to join us live. We also archive them on my YouTube channel so people can watch them later. This morning we have uh, one of our own stroke survivor, Dennis Falvey. Um, is going to do a presentation on being your own best healthcare advocate. This is something that's real important, uh, particularly to stroke survivors trying to navigate a complicated system that they know little about. Because if you're an average person, you haven't dealt with neurologists and all and physical therapy and all the things that you're going to have to deal with as a stroke survivor. So. Rather than stealing any of um, Dennis's thunder, I will turn it over to Mr. Dennis Falvey. Good morning, everyone. And you know, being the first one to do this is is a little hairy at first, but you know, I I I want to encourage you all to participate in leading one of these. What I can tell you just from being on the peripheral of helping Ralph out with this, the amount of work he puts into this is tremendous. So it's our responsibility to help share some of that workload. And I don't know that I did that for this one, but going forward, I would encourage each of us to give Ralph a little bit of a break. And I know Lauren does a lot of work behind the scenes to help Ralph. And, you know, I think we all should step up where we're capable and able to do so with our time. All right, so let me, now, I don't know. There was a talk sheet I put together and it went out to you guys several different ways. Ralph, help me out here. It was embedded in a, in a text thread at one point and then Ralph was able to reformat it and send it out as an attachment, I believe. So it's a one pager. I did that for several reasons. One is to keep myself on track and keep myself honest with what I wanted to share and, and kind of help me from wandering. Because as much as I pick on Ralph for speaking too much, you guys, I, I am an A personality like most of us and, and I could talk for hours. Uh, so I wanted to have a, a talk sheet if you would and it'll also help, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm wishful that it'll help you stimulate some thoughts on this topic too. And if you're so inclined, you can scribble some notes on it, on the page if you were able to print it and you have a takeaway or you could do little doodles on the top of my funny face or whatever you choose to do. But anyway, let's jump right into this. So. This topic's a little bit of a hairy one for a couple reasons. So again, if you have the talk sheet, you can follow along. And I start off by saying, let's do a, re a reality check on this topic. What makes this topic a little bit hairy is, and Ralph's already alluded to it, is very few of us, and I, I, I please, I don't want to offend anybody if you're a healthcare provider or involved in the healthcare system, but I can only speak for myself. Very few of us, myself included, had any experience manipulating, or I should say navigating, not manipulating, navigating the healthcare system. You know, and we learn it the hard way because again, there is no manual to follow yet but Ralph is working on that. <laughs> and the other thing that has made this extremely challenging for us right now is, and I start off on the talk sheet by saying, congratulations. You have experienced a stroke or a TBI and or are in the middle of recovery from your stroke or TBI in the, in the middle of a worldwide pandemic. And the significance of that is, and I'm only speaking for the American healthcare system. I know, Ralph, as you broadcast this, 
there are many people from European countries and other countries that are that participate in stroke buddies, but I would tell you that our healthcare system is taxed right now. I mean, many, many offices shut down. People, clinicians were working from home and trying to figure it out just like we all were. So simple little things like trying to get a hold of your doctor to make a doctor's appointment or follow up with an appointment has become extremely difficult. So uh, it is what it is. You know, we, we had this event, life-changing event. Hello? That each of us experienced in the middle of this pandemic. Hello? And that leads me to the next point. As we talk about this topic, it's important to realize there are some things we can control and there are some things we have absolutely no control over. So I'd ask you to focus on what you can control. I mean, the fact, the fact that the federal government pretty much shut down and the healthcare system is taxed, we don't have a whole lot of control over that. So all we can do is, is do our best to, you know, navigate through that reality as we, as we work on our recovery. And then it's also, this topic in particular is very, very important. And I ask you guys to help me out here to stay focused on generalities. Just like every one of our strokes were different and every one of our recoveries are different. Every one of our support, net, support systems are different too. I mean, you have, a, you have a different insurance company than I do. So as we go through this dialogue, I'd ask you to try not to speak about your specific insurance company and what you're dealing with, but rather speak general. So, so it's applicable to all of us. I mean, some of us are dealing with the, the federal or the state, you know, Medicare, Medicaid system, or maybe your state has some relief programs or your insurance company has some unique peculiarities that are not in, in general applicable to all of us. So I'd ask you to try to focus on the generalities because I'm convinced, you know, even though all of our situations are different, there is some common threads that apply to all of us, regardless of your, your unique situation. So. Let's focus on them. And, and I'd ask you to speak where you can in generalities. You know, we should try to identify with each other and not compare. And if I had a dollar for every time I say that on, the, on Stroke Buddy's site, I, I'd be a wealthy man. And uh, the point being that, you know, we all like to say, and we see these posts all the time, you know, how long will it take for me to be able to walk again? Or how long will it take for me to get use of my hand? You know, and you, you, really, you really can't compare recoveries. And you can't compare your insurance situations either. That's the point I'm making. So let's talk in generalities. Oh, is, is that, does that make sense, everybody? Yep. So Joe... Your, your state system in Illinois and your particular uh, insurance company, whatever that is, United Healthcare, I'm making that up, uh, may or may not be applicable to everybody. So let's talk in generalities. So, you know, one of the things that's important is to realize what does it mean? to be your own best health advocate. And I had put a comment there on the talk sheet that says, if not you, then who? I mean, the definition of an advocate is a, a person who is there to support and make sure your voice is heard and your questions are answered and so on and so on. Now you may have the benefit of having a personal advocate I do not, and, and every one of our support systems are different. So 
we have to rely on ourselves to be our own best advocates, in particular during this trying time with the pandemic, because, you know, if not you, then who's gonna do it? That's the point I'm making. It's important to ask a lot of questions of your doctors and therapists and keep asking the questions until you get answers. I don't know about your doctors, but my doctors like to brush things off, you know. <laughs> well, I'll go there two, three, four times until I get something useful. Now, in this case, it doesn't really help whether you're talking to a doctor face to face or whether you're on the phone with his office to be rude. You know, I try to put myself in these customer service reps position. You know, they're on the phone all day getting yelled at for minimum wage by people like us. So I try to, you know, I think you can get a little bit more with honey than you can vinegar. So I try to be kind, but I do believe that in this case, being a squeaky, being a squeaky wheel does help. I mean, you, you need to keep going there. Just don't try not to be too rude with it. And sometimes that's difficult. You know, I lose my patience, maybe like some of you do. But be the squeaky wheel. I also think it's very important to be clear with your expectations of your doctor and therapist. What do you want out of this? What are your goals? A lot of us think that, well, they're the therapist. They'll tell us what we can do and what we can't do. You know, I work with my mentors and no, if your goal is to get out of that wheelchair and walk and you don't tell your therapist that, then they don't know. You need to share your, share your expectations and goals so you guys can partner and, and have an alliance on how you're gonna get there. And that's a big part of being your own advocate. Does all that make sense? You know what I'm gonna ask you to do? Turn to the bottom of the page if you printed that. Or let's read these discussion questions up front because I wanna do this. I had printed, Ralph and I had printed like four questions that we're gonna talk about at the end, but I think if we read them together now, that'll help you maybe provoke some questions in your mind as we go through this. So these are not all inclusive by any means. These are just some thoughts that we had. The first one says, what has been your biggest challenge in this area? And again, I'm not looking for an answer now, but I wanna read these so you can think about this as we go through it. How have you overcome these obstacles or these challenges? And then have you identified any other resources to assist with these challenges? So I plant those seeds now so you can think about that as we go through this. And I'm gonna to try to move a little quicker. So slow me down because I am from New York and I can talk fast, walk fast, and uh, you know we're fast people. So uh, slow me down, or or slap me around, or you know hit the chat and say shut up, Dennis. Enough already. I don't take any offense to any of that. Matter of fact, I tell my doctors and therapists that all the time. You have a right to say, Dennis. Enough already. But that's part of being a squeaky wheel and demanding answers from your doctors and your therapists. Because they're, they're not accustomed to being accountable to anyone, but the bottom line is it's your recovery. And that's the next point I wanna make. And this is a very, very important point. And I highlighted it on the talk sheet. It says, it is your recovery. So you must accept ownership to your recovery. I see this a lot on the postings on the stroke site. You know, I'm relying on my doctor or my therapist to get me there. No, 
your therapist and your doctor will help you meet your goals if you clearly articulate them to them. But you own it. This is not something that you can brush off. We own our own recovery and we have to work for it. And the point I want to make here, a very important one is, and I see this a lot on the stroke site, never should a doctor or a therapist tell you that you will never be able to use that arm or you will never be able to walk or you will never be able to, to dance. You know, you own it. It's your responsibility. You're done recovering when you say so, not when they say so. And I don't mean to be so direct about that, but that's very important. That's very personal to me too. I think Ralph had posted two pictures of me and I wanna make reference to those photos. The first one is, you know, I had a stroke in November of 2017. And at that point, I was in a very renowned specialized hospital here in the New York area that does nothing but TBIs and, and spinal cord injuries. And the head neurologist of that hospital told me and my family that I would likely never walk again. And I looked him in the eye and I said, no, sir, you don't understand. I got some things to do yet. And he said, well, I'm just telling you, you know, I looked at your CAT scan and the part of your brain and the extent of the damage to your brain, chances are you will never walk again. And that first photo that Ralph posted is actually me walking out of that hospital four, four months later. And I'm here to tell you that four months, nobody sprinkled any magic fairy dust on me to make me walk. It was four weeks of hell. It was four weeks of hard work, four months of hard work, five hours a day, five days a week for 13 weeks. But as you can see in that photo, I walked out of that hospital in February of 2018. And the second photo is a recent photo about a month ago, my daughter got married and that's me walking her down the aisle. And it's not very pretty and I don't look very good, but that's all right. I didn't want to take away any of the eyes off of my beautiful bride, my daughter. But again, that doctor told me I would never walk again. And I told him I got things to do. And that was probably one of the most important things I had to do. That was the most important 22 feet I ever walked in my life. And again, no doctor could tell you, you won't walk or you will not ever use your hand again. It's up to you. You own it and we, we can't brush it off. This is something that we cannot shed this accountability. So being your own advocate also means accepting accountability for your own recovery. And that's the point I want to make there. And I think I've beaten that horse to the ground. Okay. Any questions? You guys are dangerously quiet. Feel free to throw out any thoughts or questions. Is, is any of this resonating with any of you? Oh, yeah. I have one. It's not necessarily a question, but it's um add-on. Um, when I had my stroke, I, one day I suddenly got a call from my insurance company, which happened to be Blue Cross, Blue Shield of North Carolina. And of course, they have different rules in every state they operate in. So I don't know if they did this everywhere, but I got a call from a neurological nurse. And she knew a lot about stroke. Well, I was about a month out or two months out. So she knew a whole lot more about stroke than I did. And I think the insurance company's motivation was to prevent me from having another stroke or to try and help me with my path to try and decrease the, uh, their costs, because um, that's what they do. But we're not here to pick on insurance companies. The point is, regardless of what their motivation was, I had her as a resource and I called on her a few times. So you could... Um, see if that's available through your insurance company, particularly if it's Blue Cross Blue Shield. 
Um, Absolutely. One other thing I found out, this is slightly an aside, but while I'm mentioning it, I will also mention that someone told me that through Blue Cross Blue Shield, if you went to PT and OT on the same day, that it only counted as one visit and I got 30 visits. So I, um, um, I, I checked with them and I found out that was true. And so I got, oh, I guess I got 58, not 60, because I had to do two evaluations and those were on different days. But I basically got twice as many by going to both on the same day. So it, actually, this does have to do with being your own patient advocate because somebody told it to me. And guess what? I called. I didn't let it sit there and rot. I said, right. that, that would be beneficial if I could get twice as much. So I, I, I made the effort. So you might check with your insurance company and see what kind of resources and things they actually have to help you. There you go. No, that's a very important point. But again, you wouldn't know all those things unless you asked. And that's, that's the key. I mean, I, I, am on long, I am presently on long-term disability with my employer. And that long-term disability service, which is an insurance company, actually provides an advocacy pr program. Now, I can't sit here and tell you they helped a whole lot, but to, as Ralph said, it was someone to bounce things off of. And I didn't even know it existed until I asked. So again, you own this. It is your, your recovery. Step up to the plate and ask questions, demand answers, and ask again and again and again. Be the squeaky wheel. Dennis? So, go ahead. If I could add one thing, and it doesn't have anything to do with insurance, but it's everything to do with being your own advocate. And I had talked to several of my uh, therapists and nurses, and not on one of them has ever been given direction from the neurologist as to what your problems will be. They are often in the dark. So as a patient, you have to know where your stroke was and what, that, what your deficiencies are gonna be based upon where your stroke was. And then you have to direct your own therapy and your own recovery based upon your own specific problems um, because um, I was unique in the fact that I had a cerebellum stroke and um, the whole thing of fast doesn't apply to a cerebellum stroke. People who have strokes aren't supposed to be nauseous and dizzy. Well, I was, um, but I spoke perfectly well. My eyes look good. I can move my arms perfectly fine. They actually sent me home um, from the first time I went to the hospital. Uh, they sent me home and I was at home for five hours. I woke up throwing up. And throwing up is not a uh, symptom of a stroke, but I was just so nauseous. So they sent me to um, another hospital and I had an MRI in the middle of the MRI. They sent me to, to surgery. But the point of it is, is even when I got to the nursing homes and the uh, stroke Recovery Hospital uh, Kindred in, in Brea, California. The way the therapist tried to, con tried to work with my stroke was absolutely the opposite of what it should have been done. Now, I wasn't conscious enough to, to know that, and I didn't know about strokes, but you really have to understand where your stroke was and what type of problems that's going to lead to and understand that that's the problems that you have and know how to handle them from there. And your therapy has to be, everybody's therapy has to be designed for what they had. You know, um, trying to get me up and get me to walk, that didn't do me any good. That just made me sicker. So when it comes to being an advocate, yes, you need to be an advocate to know what type, what your, what your benefits are from your, um, from your insurance provider, but you also have to be an advocate to know what the symptoms of your stroke was. That's right. just as important. 
Absolutely, Ed. Joe, you only find that out by what? Asking questions. You know, well, and, if you knew what the question, I didn't know what questions to ask. Right, right, exactly. But, you know, and your neurologists, I found, are not freely going to offer up that information. There is uh, no communication stream between um, your neurologist to your therapist. There is no communication stream. You have to be the communication stream. I, you know? I preach this all the time that, um, you know, when, when the doctor walks out of the examining room, they're done with you. They don't think about you until they walk in again the next time you're there. They're not connecting the dots. They're not talking to each other. Um, that was back in the 1950s and maybe the early 1960s. I was alive then, and I actually kind of remember that people, you could actually get doctors to talk to each other about your case. It's not happening now. Um, so, yeah, Joe, you're, you're right. If, it, if you have to sometimes be the conduit or else you have to try and connect the dots yourself, get your neurologist to call your physical therapist or better yet, get your physical therapist to call your neurologist because they have a better chance of getting through than you do of the uh, neurologist ever doing anything. Um, another thing this applies to is all your tests and records. One of the easiest ways, people assume that all these offices are working together properly. I, I see posts all the time. I got to my neurologist and they didn't have my CAT scan and I'm so pissed off. And I think, I don't ever say it, but I think, well, what did you do to facilitate this process other than assume that everything was going to work right? If I have, uh, what I, one way you can do this is try and collect all the information yourself. Joe, that's back to like you being the conduit again. If you get, you know, your, uh, your scans and your reports and everything, then you can take them. If you don't want to do that, and it's sometimes hard to get some of those things, uh, high quality imaging usually has to be sent through computers to computer link. Uh, you can't carry around high quality imaging on a standard CD like they give you. That's low res. But you can also call the offices and check. Um, you can also find out, like, uh, I, I did this once with someone I knew was pretty efficient, and she said to me, um, well, I've already taken care of that. So I've not bothered that office again. You, uh, um, Dennis, you were talking about, you know, catching, I was surprised, you know, uh, catching more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. I'm from New York, and I never heard that until I moved down south. I thought it was a southern thing. Anyway, there's a difference between being persistent and being annoying. I typically would write down, like when I called somebody, if they don't call me back, I don't call them back tomorrow or on day two. You know, I'll wait a week, I'll wait a reasonable amount of time so that the person that I'm annoying again, at least can say in their own head, okay, well, it's been a week. Yeah, we really should have an answer for this rather than, oh God, this guy calls every day. Um, so there's a couple or more of my two cents. No, it's a, all good stuff. I had a doctor two years ago. I got a new general physician when I moved back to Indiana. And this doctor, he wanted to put me on an aspirin reg regimen. And I thought, wait a minute. Everybody has always, already, always told me that if you have a hemorrhagic stroke, you don't want to be on aspirin. So I called my neurologist, my neurological office back in California, and I told him what was going on. And the nurse said, well, I'll call you back in about an hour or so. The nurse called me back and she said, doctor doesn't want you on aspirin. I said, well, I think I need a new doctor. And she sort of said, I can't say that, but I think that'd be a good idea. <laughs> um, so yeah, you have to be your own advocate. You have to know what you had. You know, I had a hemorrhagic stroke. Hemorrhagic strokes are not supposed to be put on aspirin. Right. You know, I had a brain, brain bleed. bleed. Aspirin's a blood thinner. I'm not supposed to be on blood thinners. You know? Um, so, I had a brain bleed, and then I turned up with AFib, and they had to put me on blood thinners. Yeah. Sure. Uh, my no, brain. A, Go ahead. Now, I had the, um, I had a heart attack the, uh, a few hours after my stroke. 
and uh, the neurologist and the and the cardiologist had an argument between them, and uh, so they didn't put me on blood thinners, but they did put me on aspirin. Yeah, so. My big deal right now that I have is I have a heart doctor that wants me to stay on my labetadol. Well, labetadol lowers your, your heart rate. And yesterday, my heart rate was at 41 beats per minute. And I had a hard time moving. Mm. So I said, okay, I'm not going to take any more labetadol, labetadol for a few days, or I'll just take one instead of three. Um, so you have to know what your medications are. You have to look it up. You have to understand. You have to, you have to learn what the side effects of your medications are and what they yeah. do. Yeah, they, and there uh, you they, go. That's they just put me on, where I said, if not there. you, then who? It's got to be you. And Joe, your examples emphasize that. Chris? I, they put me up about seven years ago after this, this stroke, they put me on beta blockers. And I couldn't move at all after that. And I said, hang on a sec. My natural pulse is 60. And you're trying to lower my, lower my pulse even more. So they said, oh, oh we didn't realize. OK, so they took me off beta blockers. Yeah, so. yeah, most beta blockers will do that. As you get older, your heart slows down. And right before my AFib, or actually, I was complaining to my doctor because I was you know, getting into the 50s. And he said, well, we don't really worry till we uh, get to the 40s. And I told him, I worry when I get below 60. And, you know, basically a nice way of saying, I don't care what you think. I think this is too low. It's real important to know your medications and side effects, okay? Because at that point, when I turned up with AFib, they did switch me. And in the next year, they switched me between three or four blood pressure medicines. And one of them was amlodipine. And after that, I noticed that my ankles were all swollen. So I looked it up and sure enough, that's a side effect. So I called the doctor and they wanted to add a diuretic. I said, no, we're not adding another pill. There are a thousand blood pressure medications. Let's prescribe another blood pressure medication that doesn't make your ankles swell. Well, since I you know, have a group and um, run another group and answer questions in about six other groups, I can't tell you how many times, oh, I, I would say in the last two weeks, I've um, mentioned that fact four times. And in every case, the per person said, oh, I'm on anlodipine. And other people in the comments, the original poster said that. And then in all the comments, other people would say, I'd paste it there too. If you're on anlodipine, uh, it could be the cause. I'm also uh, yeah. on anlodipine and my solution to the swollen ankles is to wear um, compression socks when I go to sleep. Does it work? It works perfect. Mine was to get on Losartan. Not that I'm here to, any of us are here to advertise any of these drugs. It's, it's, it seems to work. Well, one thing that I've done about my, you know, the, uh, my blood pressure is perfect and that's important. So in my, so I try to take my blood pressure a couple times a day and when my heart rate gets down or if I just get real drowsy like that, I check my heart rate, I get on the exercise bike and I spin for a couple minutes. That raises your health. That raises your heart rate. Yep. I do it mechanically, not chemically. Good idea. Well, tell me about yours, Dennis. Hey, let me mention only because this has come up on on uh, the Stroke Buddy site like three times in the last week. You know, you guys mentioned swollen ankles. My, my affected leg was swollen really bad. And I went to a foot specialist doctor and I went to my GP and they both said, it's from lack of in, you know, lack of activity. Just wear compression socks and elevate your feet. Finally, my cardiologist did a sonogram on my leg and they found a DVT. And then he said, let me do a chest CAT scan just to make sure it hasn't gone to your lungs. And sure enough, they found a very small PE. 
in my lungs. And that doctor said, take those compression socks off. That's the worst thing you can do with a DVD, DVT, because it's going to break it loose. That's not what you want. So the point is, you know, I had to go to three doctors to get an answer. And thank God they found the DVT. It could have killed me. Tris, are you leaving? I I think we lost. She pushed her screen down. Yeah, I was just going to say you're you're lucky in in this case. Being your own patient advocate may have saved you from having another stroke because we were the DVT or a lung clot. I mean, that's where clots come from. Uh, Absolutely. Holes in your heart, lungs, legs, or clotting disorders. So, you know, you got like two out of the big four right there um, in terms of causing another stroke. Right. And it was only when my cardiologist of all people did the sonogram on my leg. So, you know, my response to the people on the stroke site was talk to your doctors and explain what's going on. And, you know, don't just, you know, take it for granted. You know, the old answer, put compression socks on and elevate your feet may or may not be the right answer. But, you you know, it's okay to question and seek another opinion if you're not quite there. That's part of being your own advocate. We know so, what causes, causes DVT. It's a blood clot. So deep, what causes deep vein thrombosis? Yeah. So they put so they, they treat it with blood thinners. Right. It's what they warn you about, like on airplanes or sitting at a desk too long. You know, they tell you if you take an international flight to get up every couple of hours and walk around. Of course, I don't have any problem doing that because I got to pee sooner or later. But um, yeah, well, guys- that's what, Dennis. You asked three doctors, and the reason I repeated that for everyone was um, not that I didn't know it, but that you know these situations can be you know life or stroke threatening. You know, you could have had another stroke if you hadn't persisted. So that yeah. kind of, to me highlights the importance of of being um, persistent. And that's the point. Guys, let me do this. Ralph, I'm about done with the the itinerary, but I do want to come back to these, these discussion points that we read earlier and give everybody a chance to speak to. What's been, what's been your biggest challenge in this area? Anybody? Mine's been, you know, getting the offices um, to cooperate and getting the information that I need out of them to make them cooperate or have the materials I need to take to the um, next uh, doctor. I haven't had any real problems like, oh, I've sometimes, so like, Second time I went to see my neurologist, I made a list of 17 questions to ask him. And he answered every one of them. I was surprised. Of course, he's a European trained doctor and he didn't have on a watch. So, and he never looked at his watch. He never looked, I don't think he thought about the time. And when I was done with 17, he actually said, anything else? And um, so um, don't be afraid to um, ask. And if your doctor doesn't want to answer your questions or doesn't seem to have time for you, you know, maybe it's time to think about finding somebody that does. Now, I don't say you should, you know, switch doctors lightly, um, you know, because they have some similarities. And the thing that we're fighting here, um, Dennis, I think, is that, you know, what you ran into was they're giving you answers out of the standard playbook. They have right. they have a manual and and they kind of stick to the manual and the manual isn't always right. Well, it doesn't take the manual is right in for most people, but I'm not most people. I'm me, and so I need answers that are um, um, tailored to me, not right out of the book. So I'm with you, Dennis. When I get one that I you know question, I start 
I don't immediately question it. I start doing research because one thing, if you want to get respect from your doctors would be to know something about the subject. And uh, also don't ever tell them you found out on the internet because they all hate the internet and they all hate Dr. Google. So about the worst thing you could do is go in and say, well, I Googled it and, you know, cause you're just not going to get uh, a good, rece a good reception. But if you Good go in, if you go in like I do and try and surprise them with you know a little bit of knowledge, a little bit of the terminology, <laughs> then they they can see they perceive interest instead of know it all. How about that? We'll leave it at it's the best I can do as far as that goes. So very uh, good point. Yeah, my biggest problem is getting um, finding that information. Uh, I'm, I'm from England, therefore the um, health care is free, but you, 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 don't, you, have to, you don't always get a, um, regular, regular visits. You know, they, they're very good at um, dealing with crisis. You know, I, mean, I was in rehab in hospital for two months, and that was all free. But um, once they get rid of you, then, then that's, that's the problem after that, you know, trying to find out the information. We pay to be abused in this country. Yeah. Mm. Thank you, Chris. That's a very good point. That just goes to show you the differences that we all are dealing with, which is the point I made earlier. Everyone's situation is different. You know, I've talked to some people on the stroke site from Malaysia and the Philippines, and their health care system is almost non-existent. You know, so we complain about ours, but everyone's situation is different. All right, anybody else? What's your biggest challenge in this area? You know, we heard getting information, communication between doctors. I mean, my biggest thing that I ask all my doctors is who's the quarterback? Who's running this show here? You know, is it the neurologist or is it my GP? And yeah. they both and they both have different opinions on that, but who's the point person? Who's the funnel that all the info goes to? And I can't get a good answer on who the quarterback is. It's you, Dennis. It Dennis, has to be me. Dennis, they aren't collaborating between each other. Right, they're not. And that's the problem with the American, that's the problem with our medical profession right now. And especially if you go to different offices, um, you, know, you go to one medical clinic over here, then a hospital over there, they never talk to each other. Right. You know, um, sometimes they're at odds with each other. You know, um, so that's the biggest problem. Well, you know, you can, uh you can carry in your results or get them sent and ask them to look at it and give you an opinion. I've actually done that yeah. for a long time ago, you know, to be a pretty good advocate for myself. And then, because I tried to do physical therapy with local stroke survivors. Well, you can't really do that if they have medical problems, you know? So there's some problems that come above physical therapy. Like I went and met somebody one time and she had a shower. She didn't have a reliable caregiver and she hadn't had a shower in nine days. That's a bigger problem than physical therapy. Same with medical problems. So I've ended up like hauling a lot of people around to doctor's appointments. Um, either they have transportation issues or they have transfer issues. Nobody in their family can help them get in the car, but stroke survivor me. Um, and in some cases, I just kind of looked out for them in all ways, so I took them to their appointment. So I have a lot more experience with this than a, a lot of folks. Um, particularly with uh, one guy who I took to about 200 doctor's appointments. But um, the better you, you get at it, um, the, the better results you get. And I completely agree with the be nice, um, but be persistent philosophy. 
Yes. Okay, any other closing thoughts on your biggest challenge? Something we haven't discussed already? Well, finding out information is the biggest challenge for me. Info, got it. What problems have you had, Scott? Or should I not put you on the uh, on the spot? Uh, just like you guys are saying, like the communication be between the therapists and the doctors. Um, I purposely went, I'm in Columbus, Ohio, and I purposely had all my doctors and all my therapists go through OSU University of Ohio State. And uh, I thought that would, you know, would help the communication. It, it, it has in some areas and in some areas it hasn't. Uh, one issue that I recently encountered is um, on our last call, I talked that I recently got Botox. And um, when I went to my physical medicine doctor to get the Botox injections, he's like, oh, you should have been in here six months ago. And that just, that just really kind of did something to me. I was thinking like, you know, who dropped the ball? Who, who should have set this up six months ago? Like he said, should have been his office or should have been my occupational therapist or should have been my social worker that I've, I've only met once when I first checked in after my stroke. You know, I, I, I registered a complaint against her, but complaining about your, your, your stroke social worker is like kind of like these people that are you know, going to these police departments and complaining about the police brutality, like they don't do anything. You register your complaint and they like, they, they, they try to cover it up, you know, like well, nothing has of... happened to that social worker. The social worker constantly promised to do things for me and she never did. And I complained it, uh, about her like I should have and, and nothing happened to her. Like I, I, you know, people are brushing me off and I went to her, her manager and her managers were like, well, she said that. So I'm like, well, She's a liar, you know, like, and, and I, I constantly felt like I was being taken advantage, advantage of at the beginning because, like, I barely knew what planet I was on after my stroke. But then slowly, you know, my, my that, that brain fog started to go away. And, and then, you know, all these people promised me things. And I re remember, you know, after the brain fog went away and I'd say, you, you told me you were going to do this before. And they're like, well, oh, I forgot or they would act like they, they, they didn't remember, you know, just stuff like that. You can, well, Scott, if I could respond to that, that's why I take diligent notes. I mean, you know, when you go to her and say, on June 15th at 3.30 in the afternoon, we discussed that topic and you said you were going to do X, Y, and Z, and you would get back to me by June 7th, by day end. You know, that goes a long way. So that's the detailed notes I take with any conversation I have. Well, that's, that's you know. you. And who's going to argue that? And then that's what I've get, I've gotten. I'm like, well, you said this before. And if it's like something that's very important, they'll act like they never even said it. And they can get away with it because they see like 12 patients a day, you know? So. Right. It's like most, in most situations, you can ask for an, another caseworker if you don't like your physical therapist or occupational therapist and you're in a clinic that has multiples, I was in a small town and they had one of each. So, you know, I didn't have this option. Um, you can, if you don't like your physical therapist, don't think they're listening to you. Look around, find somebody you think is interacting with the other uh, patients in a way that you like, or somebody who seems to know something about stroke and, and ask for them, but go to the supervisor in the case of your caseworker and get somebody else. I had to do that one time. Uh, I've never had a caseworker, but I've had three stroke survivors who did. And just trying to figure out, that's a whole nother system. Uh, you want to talk about a, a big messy maze of the healthcare system, the whole social services system is yeah, I think it's more the system, like you guys are touching on. It's more the system than the individuals. You know, it's like you're going to go to another individual, you're going to get the same thing because it's the system that they work under. And I've had them right. tell me that, like they they see too many people. They, you know, you go to a you ask for a different neurologist, then you go to a new guy, and he looks at your file like five minutes before he goes and, see, and sits down with you. And I've had that happen where they 
you know, they're just, they're just jam packed with patients and it's the system. Also, doctors don't tend to disagree with other doctors unless, you know, there's, unless it's major. They're going to look five minutes before, like you say, they're not really going to know much about your case. And they're going to basically agree with the diagnosis that is on paper because that's what the manual, that's what their playbook says. The American Medical Association has a basically a, a playbook of, you know, standard answers. I don't think it actually exists, but doctors tend to give you the same answers that are hit, you know, 90% of the population. Well, a lot of us are in that other 10%. I strongly agree with that. And giving that answer is the easy, easy way out, you know, and it, it cuts their time down so they can get to the next patient, you know? Right. Well, I will say this at 90 days, I was told that because I hadn't progressed at all, I probably wouldn't. And I was sent from, uh, Kindred Hospital, which is a rehabilitation hospital, a therapy hospital, to a nursing home. And I was denied therapy. I didn't get any occupational therapy, speech therapy, any of that. It was all denied. But look at me. I'm here. You know? So I say, when it comes to being your own advocate, thank God for YouTube and, and Facebook. I figured out what was going on. And I became my own therapist, both mentally and physically. And um, pretty soon I need to go finish cutting my, my grass, which is about half a football field. So uh, I'm doing okay. I'm dizzy as heck, but, and that's another thing. Through my entire stroke, my time in the, at the Kindred Hospital, also at um, the nursing home, Nobody could tell me why I threw up three or four times a day. Nobody could tell me why my ent entire upper body went, in, went into space or froze up. I found all this out myself. I learned. Um, I read. And that's the problem is, you know, the good thing is I was able to do that. The problem of it is, is there's a lot of people out there that aren't. There's a lot of people that don't understand physical therapy. They think that their therapist comes in and works with them for a half hour and that should do miracles. Sorry. Yeah. That was just the beginning of it. Be your own advocate when you can. You know, after my stroke, I couldn't be my own advocate. I couldn't even tell the time. My therapist pointed at the wall and said, tell me what time it is. And I just froze up. You know, you want to advocate yourself when you can, but if you can't tell the time, you're not, you know, you're not going to be able to do that. But yeah, when my when my mind came back, you know, I I'm, I'm always sticking up for myself. You know, I'm I'm always the one in the in the the room that says no, and everybody else is saying yes. You know. Well, one other thing that I think um, I've had this, you know, come up too, and one of the things that I do is I go back and inform the person that couldn't tell me. I give them the answer. I don't know if it does any good. But I figure if, you know, if, if they don't know and then you tell them, and I try and tell them in a fairly scientific way that indicates that, you know, I actually research it and what I'm telling you is right. I'm hoping that the next time somebody asks, you know, they'll go, oh, you know, I heard about that and, and re repeat it. I don't know, like I said, if it doesn't any good, but guess what? It's like you get nothing to what you don't try for. So it's kind of like if I don't do it, there's no chance that anybody's going to pass that info on. So okay. I Listen, we're, we're about going to run out of time. So I want to hit this one last discussion point. Okay. The one that says, have you guys identified any other resources to deal with these challenges? And try to keep it general in nature, not specific to your, your scenario, but general. You know, I heard Scott talk about social workers or, or social services, you know, that could, be, that could be applicable to many different states and agencies and insurance companies. And, and Ralph talked about asking your insurance company, are there other resources that we're not exploring? Anything else? The only thing I use at the moment is trial and, trial and error. Um, See if, see, if, see if doing something works. And if it doesn't, I'll modify it. That, that's the only thing I can do, really. 
I Googled cerebellum stroke. And right there was all the answers. All the questions I had was, were answered in that one single article. You know, why was misdiagnosed? Why I threw up every day? Why was having problems with my balance? It all came, you know, it all came in. Uh, okay, so that's been talked about. That's good. That's do your own research, you know, do your homework. One, one other one is um, some of the um, device supplier service companies have um, websites. I think that what they realize, like, um, okay, two I could name are Sabo and uh, Flint Rehab. I know there are other ones out there. And I'm not talking about all of, you know, the YouTubers, Dr. Tobias and Orlando Neuro and that kind of thing. But these are people who make a product and they supply information on their websites. Flint Rehab, for example, has got a bunch I don't know, 50 or 100 good articles on different aspects. Yep, of I stroke. use them. Yeah, and why do they do that? They do that because, you know, if you go there all the time and look to them for their answers, then pretty soon you're going to say, what's the deal with this music glove they make, you know? Um, so they do it to um, pass the information and to, you know, get you familiar with... Um, their product or service. So that's something that you could um, look for. I generally have found those and gotten onto those by doing what Joe was talking about, basic Google search. And Joe, if you bookmark that article, I'd love it if you could send it to me. I'm always looking for ones like that, that answer like, you know, the eight of the 10 most important questions, because then you can send somebody to one place and they can get a whole bunch of answers rather than you know, ha having 10 bookmarks to get 10 answers. So if you have that, uh, I'd love to uh, have that article just for my resources and the uh, manual that uh, Dennis seems to think I'm working on. Well, it will be a manual. It's just going to be a website or a platform. And this is the start of it. What we're doing here is the start of it. And I think it's good. Okay. Now, Ralph, I'm going to let you handle this last question dealing with future topics or future calls okay yeah what um what this one's about is you know we started this um lauren and i to find out more about what people want and well we found out a few things we found out that people prefer to watch them on youtube than to show up uh live and a few other things but we're still looking for um, you know, subjects and, and topics of, 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 of concern or, or problems that people are having so that we can address them. It, um, uh, you know, if you've listened to this last hour, all of us actually know probably a little bit more about stroke than the average stroke survivor. So we're not doing this for ourselves. It's interesting, no doubt about that. But we're doing this to try and spread information, to try and spread some of the things that each of us have learned to the poor newbies out there that are, you know, just have been uh, forced into um, a system that uh, they've not dealt with before. Um, I never talked to a neurologist before my stroke. I never went to physical therapy before my stroke. I mean, I knew what all of them were, but... So if anybody has anything uh, that there is a concern, there's a number of ways you can do it. You can just, you could um, message it to me. You could uh, write a comment on any one of these um, meetings, videos, when we post them on YouTube, you could make a post in Stroke Buddies or one of the other groups. Um, there are a lot of ways. Um, so if people will tell us what they need, we'll try to address that. I'll, you know, you know when it gets outside of the of our knowledge of this basic group, we can look to um, uh, experts. Um, Lauren has identified someone from MedRhythms to um, give us a little presentation on 
how music therapy works, you know? And um, I actually, I read profiles when people come into the groups and to try and keep out the spammers. You know, somebody who joined Facebook yesterday has got one friend, nothing on their profile and lives in Nigeria. It's probably not a good person to let in. And I came across one where um, uh, she was an occupational therapist. And so uh, it was actually for young stroke. So I wrote to her and said, please consider joining Stroke Buddies. And I noticed you're an occupational therapist. Would you be willing to come on our Tuesday thing? And she said, yes. So um, she's not practicing anymore. So that will be, um, actually that sounds like a bad thing at first, but it's a good thing because if you're practicing, you have licensing issues and there's certain things you can and can't say. So she could be a little bit more open and she can also share her experience as an occupational therapist who went through the same thing that all of us are going on. I'm looking forward to that for a couple of reasons. Her story's probably interesting, but also um, you know, if we could get neurologists, physical therapists, occupational therapists, music therapists, you know, various types of experts, then we can bring in those expert outside opinions. But we don't know what to do unless you tell us what to do. I mean, we all have things that we're interested in and you know we can proceed with those, but the more feedback we get from you through any number of, of, uh, of, of channels, uh, the more focused we can make these meetings and the more benefit they will be to everyone. And, you know, we need a lot of chapters in that manual. It's, you know, it's got a hundred chapters and we don't necessarily know what all of them are. We each had a stroke uh, and our stroke was unique and our recovery is unique and we learned some common things, but there are people out there that go through things that, I mean, I see stuff every day and went, wow, I never thought about that. So if you're one of those, wow, I never thought about that folks, let us know. Um, does that cover it, Dennis? Absolutely. And, and just to emphasize, I think Joe's committed to next week. Yes. 